Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Apollo's Odyssey. I'm your host, Apollo Asteria, and I have a really amazing interview lined up for today with uh, Mary Edwards, who I met at the Mount Shasta Summer Conference uh, the last weekend, or not this last weekend, but the weekend before, I guess. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to her. She came up to my booth and started talking to me and mentioning that she has done work with designing the interior of the International Space Station, uh, working for NASA. And uh, as you may or may not know, when I give my Solutions for Manu presentation, I always get into space habitats towards the end and how uh, space habitats are, is an amazing solution for humanity and how we can move forward in becoming a space-faring civilization. So I'm really excited to uh, let Mary share with you all her ideas on all this and discuss this with her. Also, she has a really incredible background story, which I'm uh, excited for you all to hear. It's going to be a really great show tonight. So uh, before we get started here, I, I want to remind you, I will be doing my show every Wednesday again as much as possible. So please make sure you tune in 5 p.m. Pacific on Wednesdays every week. Uh, sometimes I throw in another show here and there, so it just depends. But I'm really excited to be here tonight, giving the show from my studio, and uh, had a lot of fun with my last show here, so it's going to be fun. Okay, uh, before I get started here, I want to remind you all to please check out my spears over at shamanspears.com. I make uniquely handcrafted energy chilling devices, which I've invented myself. Uh, they're all kind of for the purpose of basically amplifying energy. Uh, they're all filled with copper coils, crystals, magnets, and sand I collect from sacred places around the world down the insides. And they're very powerful. So, um, yeah, this is basically kind of what funds me and keeps me going. So if you want to support me and my show, please go to shamanspears.com. And check them out. I have uh, the link at the bottom of the show uh, in the show description and also um, scrolling across the bottom of the screen there. And I have some other amazing art here as well. So definitely go to shamanspears.com and check that out. And I'm actually working on my new collection right now. So I'm really excited about that. That's going to be the Ultraviolet collection. Uh, so that one's might not be out for another couple months or so, but it's going to be really great. So really stoked about that. So uh, without further ado here, let me bring on our guest for tonight. Mary, how's it going? How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good to see you. Nice good, to see you. To, good to see you as well. It was really great meeting you at the Mount Shasta Summer Conference. Uh, I had a really great time there. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, how did, how did you feel about the conference? Did it go well for you? I loved it. I was very excited to be there to meet you and see Ben and meet different people and see some old friends. And um, I loved your, hearing your talk and seeing you up on stage and hearing your story more too. So I loved it. It was exciting. And I'd never been to Mount Shasta before. And oh, I did really? five the first night and I loved it. It was great. Wow. Well, yeah, it was really incredible meeting you. And uh, yeah, it was so amazing to have you in my presentation, as I was mentioning before I brought you on, you do work with space habitats too, technically. I mean, you're uh, an interior designer, but you started designing the International Space Station. So can you give the audience here a little bit about your background and what you've done with your work? Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, it's 
again, it's nice to be here. Um, I grew up in a pretty interesting family, like I guess we all probably did a long time ago. And um, uh, my father was a basically a rocket scientist who had uh, taken and in, gone into business with it as aerospace company with his father, as so did his two brothers. So I grew up with a father who was loved space, loved the outdoors, and a mom who was an artist and really out there, creative. Um, and they love, both loved to travel. And my, her father happened to be an architect. So I grew up with earth architecture and space design, which was really a great combo. There weren't really many drab conversations at the dinner table. Um, oh, wow. So, and when you grow up, I grew up in the 1950s. I was born in 1951. So I was literally part of the first space race. So our dinner conversations, when my father was there, six or seven months out of the year, he was traveling for his business um, for many months out of the year. He would talk about being down in the desert and then being at Cape Canaveral. And But I didn't realize till much later that he was part of Secret Space and that a lot of the things that he was doing for the U.S. government and for NASA was also uh, uh, part of Secret Space as well, I guess I should say. So um, I grew up in a big house right on Lake Michigan. And... I knew that when I came out of the box that I was weird and different <laughs> and um, shy. And I literally put aside here so I could show you. I didn't talk for the first few years. I started painting rocks that I think were either planets or orbs because I was taken on craft at age five. But this is what the living proof from 65 years ago, basically, of what I was doing as a little girl. Um, and I pulled this one up, too. Oh, wow. Um, wood in the, in the, we weren't allowed to paint or draw or get dirty in our house. It was a very formal, yeah, could, you know, fancy upbringing. But I, these are my validation that I was really a, not only love art, but that I was thinking about these things and painting them and drawing them, um, which was pretty crazy. So these were the only thing left from my childhood <laughs> of, of my early of my early art. But um we, we spent a lot of time traveling the world, even from a young age, which gave me a lot of exposure to my design, which I'll talk about in a second. But we went to oh, Stonehenge when I was nine years old, and we went to wow. Africa and India and Tibet and Nepal. So we, they wanted, my parents wanted us to expose us to different cultures and different people and different backgrounds, which in our little fancy neighborhood we obviously didn't see and I was really sort of appalled by it so um that was really <laughs> fun for me to go to Ireland and see you know the, they dropped me off and I'd take photographs of gypsies and then in India I started a rug business like 50 years ago there when on one of our trips to visit all the Maharaja's palaces so wow. anyway we it, um it was silver spoony but I, I was never that way um but and I really appreciated the travel and the exposure so um I thought it was a pretty normal family until I had started having these dreams when I was a really young girl and I got taken on a craft at age five from my house in Kenilworth up to the craft and, and then again at age six. And I don't have a lot of memory of that other than I remember lying on a table, you know, that was very cold with three grays and my father there and over the decades when he wouldn't talk to me about it, I kept saying, why were you there? <laughs> what was I doing up there? So anyway, um, I, I had that in the back of my mind for my entire life and knew that was real. And it was pretty, it was great and a little freaky, but I loved it because I love, I love, always loved adventure and I have an open mind. <laughs> then I went back up on 10 on one of those three to four mile, big, huge craft and remember having um, information, stats, math, information stuck in my head. And that was the first time my dad actually took me um, which I'm just starting to remember. And I've, I've talked to different readers to help me um, understand this because I'm still got a lot of my own brain washed. Most of it that are still coming just in um, little flashes that I get. But he took me up that first time at age 10 and we went to Mars and Jupiter and Pluto. Um, and I guess I was gone for a couple of weeks and they showed me around. And then from there on until um, a few weeks ago, I was um, going up on my own with mostly the Palladians and Arcturians to look at inside of habitats. 
But to go back to my what I thought was a normal upbringing first, other than that, <laughs> um, I I wanted to go. I I went lived in Europe for summers because I didn't want to hang out there. So it was always about art. It was always about art history. It was always about design. It was always about architecture. Um, I grew up on job sites with both my father and my grandfather. I was the middle of three girls and neither of my sisters, my, my sister's a graphic designer in New York City, but they weren't in a space like I was. So I was lucky that I got to hear all the stories from my father about the Russians and the re reentry systems that he did with his company throughout my whole childhood. Then I, I went to I went to boarding school and then I went to um, college in Boston and in the first day of art history class, I saw a UFO in an art slide and I went, oh my gosh, duh. You know, so I had many, many different little glimpses along the way, but that one. Like really Renaissance art, you're saying? Renaissance art. And there were all those UFO pictures. And I went, oh my God. And two weeks later, I had someone come to the school, which is a pretty waspy school in, in Brookline on reincarnation. So, you know, all along the way, I look back at every decade of my life and I had um, things that were waking me up as, as we all do. Right. So, um, like that, that was great. I was protesting the Vietnam war back then. As you can imagine being that being as old, <laughs> I love it. Actually. Oh, no way. I totally would have been doing the same thing back then. <laughs> where, where were you protesting? Well, my boyfriend that I met at the first week of school was at Harvard and I saw these Mouseketeers up on his wall. And I said, you're not Tom, Tommy from the Mouseketeers. And he said, yes. <laughs> so anyway, we dated for a little while, but he was head of the SDS and in, in Cambridge and you know, Boston, I was in Boston. And um, I said, well, I hate the Vietnam War. I was, I've always been very active, an activist. And um, so he said, well, come on out. And I went to a few rallies with him um, and while I was in school and there was that huge one in Cambridge. We were on the front row. I was on the cover of Newsweek, Goodbye to the 60s with Kennedy, a spaceman <laughs> with an astronaut and um, the Beatles. And there's me going like this, just going like whatever I was saying. I won't repeat it here, but <laughs> at it, I'm more in the government. So I and I grew up next door to Senator um, Percy, Chuck Percy, who was a, um, a Republican uh, was a um, big, very influential um, senator who lived next door to us. And he had me, you know, working for his campaigns when I was a little girl. And and then his daughter married the Rockefellers and she was murdered in, in the house when I happened to be home from boarding school. So there was, you know, a lot of wow. really powerful people around us. I saw black men, uh, men in black at my house. I we had senators and presidents and my grandfather used to play golf with the Eisenhower, you know, blah, 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 on and on and on. And my father's um, uncles uh, worked at the aeronautical or a space company called Cook Electric that was in Morton Grove that they had from right before the World War II. And they sold it at 19, in the 1990s when NASA shut down um, to Northern Telecom to do similar things. But so I grew up with, uh, the, I heard politics from both sides. I got to travel and listen to all these things, but I always knew that people were lying to me. I always, because I'm psychic and intuitive. I always knew that a lot of it was just baloney and that I wanted the truth and I really wanted to get out of there. So I went to Boulder after Boston and I got a BFA in fine arts. I bought my first house. I renovated it. I'd sanded the floors. I <laughs> did the walls. I bought it and then bought a six acre ranch and I bought four old little houses and put them on crates in the middle of the night. We had to take down all the lines. So I was sort of a little entrepreneur at age 20 doing yeah. um, design and, and development that I'd grown up with too. My family did a lot of development. So I was really used to construction and I love construction sites. So anyway, I, I was a Boulder. I got a BFA and then I got, I started working on the side in, in at, at a couple of architectural firms. And then after two years, I, I started at working at a, architectural firm called Communication Arts. And we were designing the Star Trek logo at the time. So I was part of that 40 years ago. So that's that so really incredible. <laughs> Which is now basically the Space Force logo. It's exactly. <laughs> and they pull me in in all the different meetings. We did Daniel Hall and Madison Square Garden. We did a lot of work for Disney down in, you know, in LA. I spent a lot of time down there. 
we were doing um, event centers all over the all over the country, big ones. Um, Santa Monica Place. I mean, I have the old brochure, and they're still best friends. Santa Monica Place. Um, International Air Terminal, New York City. And it was all about creating, it was called Com Arts, and I was, it was a miracle that they hired me. I was going to interior design school at night. And they said, oh, you, you've traveled a lot. You come from a multidisciplinary background. Um, we, what we create, it says here, create a place that people can experience that is meaningful, where they feel an, a personal connection. This is what will prolong their stay and bring them back. So I, I started out with this huge firm that we were doing these this all over the world, Abu Dhabi. We were traveling, um, as I said, all these incredible wizard wizards at Universal City. Um, I wasn't the main director uh, one, and one of the head directors of design, but I did get to work at a lot of these. Um, so that was really exciting. Staples Center, you know. And so I, I learned about, it says, Regional beliefs and customs are an invaluable resource from which we draw inspiration in creating places for people that contribute to their pride and sense of community. So this started about 20 years of working at, um, here's where the World Trade Center we worked on. Oh, and wow. You worked on the World Trade Center? Really the biggest, yeah. And then we did all the conceptual design for you know a lot of Disney work. And here's, let's see. Washington, you know, we just did a lot of work all over, but it was all about ideas. It says Comart's design ideas are the intellectual bridges that link clients, places, and products to the markets in, in ways that are memorable, distinguishing, and enjoyable. So I grew up with that, and we worked 70 hours a week. It was just fantastic. It was people from all over the planet that came to work in Little Boulder. So anyway, I got many years there. And which was incredible. Then I moved to San Francisco and started working at Skid Moorings and Merrill. And then I was going to architecture school at night. So I, I got my BFA in interior design degree in an architecture school. And um, then I went to sustainability school after that. So I could learn about my grandfather, who was the architect, standardized two by fours because he hated the waste of wood when we were growing up in Chicago near Frank Lloyd Wright. So anyway, I, want, I knew I was on a mission to help people in their interiors to weave together all the aesthetics and art and design that I'd seen my grandfather and my father do in space. And then I got hired at NASA, <laughs> to the third year of architecture school, which I quit in a nano minute and started working at Moffat Field with Dr. Yvonne Clearwater, which was- What's that? Yeah, Dr. Van Clearwater was hired to set up the first habitability and human factors department out of Moffett Field about 28 years ago, 30 years ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. But we they wanted to create a, an international space station for the first time that really was cross-cultural, personal, and for the human factors, the so, so, so psychological issues, the, all the socio and psychic um, problems and issues that they had in space, not just sticking astronauts up in space. So we, um, I worked with her exploring the range of meeting and variants of human experience and isolation, confinement, solitude, and loneliness living and working in space. Well, I felt like I'd grown up with that anyway, being like we are starseed <laughs> coming here. I never felt, I never felt at home. I felt more at home in the space station down at Houston, at Johnson Space Center and Moffett Field than I did anywhere. And I've done thousands of homes and offices and hotels and restaurants all over the world. But NASA, I found my home in. So we did this first human factors at um, space, at, which was unbelievable. And I drew these and I brought nature inside that, you know, the astronauts have to exercise an hour and a half every day. So I Actually, they were laughing at me. All the architects there said, you can't bring trees in. So I, I did murals. I had them. We made murals on the wall so they could actually pretend that they were exercising outside. Oh, wow. That's really nice. And then color coding was was we, we hired a team of uh, 25 people, earth ground orientation, um, to really try to help center and ground the astronauts in space that nobody had really thought of before. So Dr. Von Clearwater and I hired psychologists, specialists in all different ways. And she and I really, she was the double PhD and I was the creative. And together we just 
really had a blast along with, of course, a lot of other people. Um, but that was really launched my love of space and felt like everything all really clicked. I think I was 33 then. Um, oh, wow. So um, that, and then they, then they asked me after three or four years of being a contractor there, they said, would you like to work on Mars? I was about to get married a few years later and I just got pregnant with my son. Well, we got married and then I got pregnant. doesn't matter. But, um, and, and so I thought, well, I can't be flying down to Johnson Space Center. And I had also had it, now I had it, had it also 15 people design from. Um, and I was teaching at the Academy of Our College four nights a week to help other kids learn about design and, and textiles and stuff. So I was sort of busy. Wow. But, um, <laughs> so so I, just, I had to say goodbye to NASA because I just knew it would be seven days a week. And it was already six days a week. But my husband, my husband at the time was happy with that. So anyway. I mean, so that was like year. I, I mean. Long time ago. It was a long time ago. And, and they were working on places on Mars? Back no, then? They were just about to start. And I said, well, what do you mean on Mars? Are you going to start designing and, and doing habitats? That, and they said, no, we're just starting. Everyone, since I'm older, I'm 71 years old. Everyone, people, my father was obsessed by Mars. I was obsessed by Mars as a young child. Everyone's always been obsessed by Mars because they thought that that environment was the closest to our habit, to our living environment here and its location. So there, that was, that's been a part of my like obsession with Mars has been since I was a little girl <laughs> and other people that friends of mine that worked at NASA and Lockheed and JP and all other firms, we've all, we were all talking about Mars back then too, just because of, it was always the next horizon. I mean, I came to California, my mom's a Sherman and she, her, my grandfather, her great, my grand grandfather moved to Sherman, created Sherman Oaks, and then developed down to Hollywood, which is what that is now. It was right yeah. in the Cadillac Desert. So our family were always entrepreneurs, and they were always way ahead of everybody, like you are, and a lot of people watching here. I know we all have our own gifts here and our own um, skills. We all play our part, who are passionate about our mission and passionate in whatever space area we're in right right so um, that started in me as a young child I mean we used to come out to San Francisco just to and to go down to Hollywood to meet our all our relatives and and see the development that was going on and 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 participate Mama was said even when we were little she said don't stay in the Midwest go to the East Coast or go to the West Coast because that's where the action is that's where all the smart create creative people were so um, and my, her uncle was the mayor of San Francisco here in 1942 to 46. And I wasn't oh, wow. then, but we used to come out and visit their family here too. So I've always been called and lured to California. And then when I was got inter, 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 invited to go down to get interviewed at NASA, that was a dream come true. That's really incredible. And, and you know, I'm wondering, since that was so long ago that the they were wor talking about building on Mars. I mean, do you think there's already stuff being built there? Like, I mean, you know, I, I've heard a lot about, you know, NASA possibly being a front or, you know, like you mentioned the secret, like a s secret space program earlier. Like, what are your thoughts on all that? Like, do you think uh, there's like a secret space program that's doing more work than NASA is doing in regards to like going kind of, off planet already? I think they have been for a long time. You know, just because I've been getting out, I'm getting into this world right now, talking to you and other people just over the last few years, since my mom actually passed at 98. And I knew I would never have my own voice to be able to talk about these things. My dad passed about 10 years ago. And I've talked to him up in heaven many times up till a few weeks ago. And I said, are you still inventing up there? And he said, yes. And I said, I'm so mad at you that you never talked to me about the, you know, you going, you've been to Mars 14 times in the 50s and 60s. Warner, you know, Dr. Warner von Braun worked at his, his, his company, him and his father's company for five years. I said, you were, and he went during when he went, was at Princeton? He, the World War II started and he went to the Aleutians as a, and he became a lieutenant in the Navy. He was a pilot in the Aleutians during the war. 
And when he got left, he came back and he was, he was in Einstein's imagination class. He already had a relationship with him and had already wow. met Oppenheimer. And then evidently, which I've never heard of any, we never discussed any of this. So I'm not really, I, I don't know about that firsthand at all. Um, but I know he did. My sister did. One, one cousin told me that dad did work on the Manhattan Project. But so anyway, dad did wow. tell me from up there, he said, Mary, he went like this. And he said, um, through a friend of mine that I can't read, I can't unblock some of the things that I've been part of for a long time yet. But he was talking to me and he said, Mary, I, I'm so sorry. I couldn't talk to you. I we would all, I'd be dead. We'd all be dead. It was duty, honor and country. And I was in the Navy and part of the government and part of NASA. So he was sort of a triple whammy of, and he was a loyal, he was a real Princetonian, Choton Princeton Northwestern. And then so, and he was, you know, a part of this, that old boys club back then that was pretty powerful <laughs> with um, their intuition and their literally, and their brilliance and education um, and some other probably bad stuff too. But um, they, dad was an incredible guy, but he said he's still up there inventing and he likes some of the work I've been doing. And he just said, I'm sorry, I couldn't talk to you for your whole life. And I said, well, I'm talking about it now. And, and I he was silent. And I just said, I, you know, this is a generation of new people. They want to know what's going on in this frontier. We have to teach our children well and ex prepare them and expose them and um, give them the understanding like I was not because they need to know what's going on, which is why I asked Barbara Lamb to do that book last year and, and a couple other books. Oh, and by the way, can you share uh, the book with everyone here? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I went to the first contact in the desert in, I think, 2019, ever. I sort of told my kids and friends I was going down to a real estate conference or a design conference because I, oh, wow. and I was like, I can't not do this anymore. I've been a single parent my whole life and I for most of my life. And I just thought I can't. I've had too many experiences. I've been told for 50 years, probably by astrologers in the beginning, then psychics. I've had regressions with Barbara and different people. For 50 years, people said, you're going to completely wake up when you're 70. People in India told me that in China and Hong Kong and Denver and San Francisco. And I mean, I've been going asking people about all this, this other part of my life that I was keep, I was trying to keep a solid grounding for my children because I was doing it by myself and supporting them and everything. And, um, I just knew I had to wait and I would do my own research, but then I opened Pandora's box when I could after mom and dad had passed. So they weren't, um, you know, mad at me or, or <laughs> exposing information. And so I really don't talk much about that uh, or much more about that. Um, but um, he, I know he was part of the hybridization program. I was part of the hybridization program that my grandfather was. We go back 93 generations of 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 the, of this but anyway so and the hybridization that's with the grays right right I mean, that's usually ours was with mine was with the good grays and they took um 978 of my eggs they harvested them they took them for me on that when i was age five and age six and then they do different things with them they use them for different ways and i and just in the last three years, I, I so these psychics and astrologers and people in the olden days, I do past life regressions. We didn't really do regressions till the last many years. And I've done a bunch of them. And this is, this is the same thing that comes out. I, I get it. I already sort of knew this. But um, they all said, if you're, if they look at me and they'd say, you're a star seed. You're a baby mama. And it was, they freaked me out. I mean, I'd be walking in India and Bombay with my rug business that I had there for about eight years, a long time ago. And, and it was like, why is everybody calling me a baby mom and a star seed? I knew I had wow. gifts like we all do here. We all have, play, you know, we all have different clairs or different gifts that we have. And I always knew that I could see through space. I knew I could shift energy. I knew I had my dad's photographic memory. I knew I was really smart, but I also knew I was really dumb because I couldn't remember. I didn't know that why I couldn't remember. And part of that's post-traumatic stress disorder from what I've been through. Part of it's dyslexia and ADD, ADHD and processing issues. But a lot of it was from what happened in the beginning, but that I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for because it is, I'm part of 
past, present, and the future of humanity. And I, I've always known that I was here for a reason. I, always knew that. I knew that in the womb. I really did. It was really weird. So anyway, I went to my first real conference at, in 2019 at Contact in the Desert and went to a cu couple of Conscious Life um, uh, conferences down there, you know, during sort of before, before COVID. And I, I walked, I heard Barbara Lamb. I met a lot of um, the group that we all, Bar Mary Rodwell, with all these wonderful people telling us information about others' experiences. And I really love Mary and, you know, just oh, Linda Moulton Howe. I mean, just all of them. And I spent time talking with them and bonded with a bunch of them. But Barbara, I said, I walked up to Barbara and I said, oh, I love your talk. And I know you've done all these regressions. Would you like to do one on me? But I have a feeling I want, I want to do a book with you. And she looked at me and here we are down in LA at the LA Hilton or wherever it was. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I've been waiting my whole life to do a book to tell my story. I said, the Palladians and Arcturians in my ear have been saying, write the book, write the book. And I said, I don't, I never had a book to write about, but I said, now I'm just learning about some of my background and some of my understanding with that now I know that I've, I was learning that even in the beginning, the last five, four or five years, I guess, about the hybrid kids that I had and was fascinated and wanted to learn more. So I said, can I meet you down in San Diego in a few weeks, get your calendar out. Let's, I'm flying down from San Francisco where I live. And I said, can I just come down and spend a weekend with you? And you'll do a couple of regressions. And we really hit it off. And I said, do you want to do a book together to, use all your beautiful regressions and use my stories. That's me. I did the illustrations. They're not very good. <laughs> I wanted to keep it sort of kid-like, but that's me when I was five years old with my bow and my hair. And that's Aww. the way. And those are my friends, the Arcturians, who have also been with me forever. And we called it Kids Adventures with ET Friends in Space based on stories of friendship and learning between human kids and, and, and ETs. So I said, I don't want to put anything creepy in it. I don't want to talk about the yucky part of what I, what I went through. Cause in the olden days, you know, it was a little more physical than, so, than it has been in recent times. So we picked 18 of her regressions that we both agreed on. And then I tried to draw them as much as I could about all the wonderful things the children have learned in the process of her 4,000 regressions that she's done over I think she just turned 87. I talked to her a couple of weeks ago. I think it's 86. Anyway, whatever she is, she's unbelievable. Lots of years of wisdom and amazingness. So um, we spent oh six or eight months drawing some of the most positive ones. Of some, you know, sometimes when I camp out in the back backyard, they come and take me up in their spaceship. Oh yeah, you get to see my space friends. And then you know, then the, the little kids are taught to teach them how to fly the spacecraft. And they tell them when I grow up, I'll fly their ship again, you know, once in a while. So we took some of the ones that we thought were the most interesting ones. Um, and not to scare kids, but really to show them, yes, you got to get on a table because I like that was me. And they, they do do that. So I wanted to stick one of those in there. And we wanted to put a reptilian in and, and just sort of go through some of the basics um, and what the, I drew Barbara as a little girl. <laughs> I'm sure she was much better looking than that. I said, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, talking about the beautiful blue lady, one of her clients had, I love it when this beautiful blue lady teaches me to heal with energy from my hands. I think of her as an angel. She says she's an Arcturian. Hmm. So, and that's what I, I'm still probably alive from the Arcturians, from some of the freak outs that I had on and off in my life, not understanding this, not having anybody to talk to. So we, we went through and um, we talked about hybrid kids. And I have, um, out of my 128 hybrid kids, I just found out about three weeks ago, I think I mentioned that to you, that I have 25 more and oh, wow. half of them are on craft, living on craft, because you know they the hybrids so a lot of the hybrids look a little too different to live on Earth. They would be made fun of, so they live on craft, and there are you know thousands of craft floating around above us with Palladian crafts, Arcturian crafts, where these kids grow up. And um, so I really wanted to put some of those in. I have, um, for instance, I have two hybrid kids that are in their twenties. 
So I was called a baby mama because I had so many babies. I've talked to a lot of people that had have 20 babies, have children or 30 hybrid children or 50, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have more than I do, but I, I was shocked when I heard a few weeks ago that I have 128 because, yeah. yeah, so. What do you think is the reason for the hybridization program? I mean, what what is the purpose of it? Well, you know, again, I'm not an expert on a barber, but I'll be a better person to talk to. We've been on probably 50 interviews talking about it a little bit, but continuation of our humanity, I think really, uh, we've, you know, if we really did start at Mars and it died, we came here. Evolution happens, you know, all these times we know we've seen throughout our history, something could happen. It's, I think it's uh, um, confidence for the future. It's partly experimentation and survival of the fittest, which we see in different ways. Um, but I think mostly I like, I'm a positive person. So I always like to see it's for the continuation of our humanity. And, and you know, I've talked to different people who are up there probably like you have too. And they just said, you know, it's just gonna keep our, our expansion out to the universe is gonna just keep getting bigger and wider. There will be communities of Palladians or humans or this and that. So we, we know that there's, there's gonna be a lot of expansion with in the next 20 or 30 years. We know Elon Musk says he's gonna have 100 people um, sent uh, to by Mars to in the 2030, um, three star rockets going out each day. So um, I've been waiting for this my whole life. I can't wait. I hope I'm still around. Oh, I'll be going anyway, but. <laughs> so anyway, this book has been very, very helpful just to end the story on that because I'm jumping around a lot. But this really has helped so many children who maybe like you and like me, who didn't thought that they had been taken off planet or thought they had seen an entity in their room or felt somebody or talked to people when they were, didn't know who they were when they were children. I've gotten hundreds of letters and we've gotten thousands of responses saying, thank you. And then parents wake up. I mean, I talk to older people, younger people. It's, you know, all these books, all these things that you're doing, all of us talking right now really helps open up we are the disclosure. So we really do help open up channels of confidence and avenues for people to talk about it. Um, talk that's, about it. So. That's really incredible. I, I really appreciate the work you've done and I, I'm glad you're really helping uh, give a, basically something for the young children to look at too. So this is really amazing. Uh, you, you mentioned the Mars uh, colony. I want to pull up the article that you sent me earlier today. I actually pulled it up here. Oh, you were good. mentioning, oh, this is the wrong one. Let me see here. Um, there it is, okay. So this is, uh, you sent me this earlier today and these are concepts of possible um, 3D printed Mars, uh, Mars habitats. Yeah. And if you just stop at any of them, we can just sort of read it too. It's just unbelievable because, you know, we know that it's going to be difficult. Anybody knows it's going to be difficult living on Mars. It's what, 44 below zero. It's really windy. It's cold. It's scary. There's the, you can't breathe the air. So what this um, NASA and SpaceX and all these different um, school um, contests that they have, um, design content for interior designers and architects. And also when my daughter ended up working at Lizzie, who's at Salesforce now in London, but she, when she worked at NASA for three years, about six years, seven years ago, before she started at Salesforce, she worked for Dr. Von Clearwater at Moffett Field. And she was spending a lot of time down at SpaceX. And she was taking a lot of kids around Moffett Field and they were asking questions. It was way more advanced, of course, than when I was there a couple decades ago. But, um, what, and what she was doing, Avon and she and I'd come down and we were doing contests with public schools and private schools, having them draw different little simple habitats. What do, you, what do you look like when you're living on Mars? So this is such a widespread, beautiful thing that they're doing now. So oh, and this is incredible. Isn't that just one of my favorite ones? And oh, wow. this, this one from Dubai 
Um, it says this beyond a specialist team will enroll themselves. Some of these, this one art, particular couple of these architects are really building, actually going to build these huge habitats in, on Earth and, and try it out. Some of these habitats, like this one I love too, this ice house that I printed out to show in case you hadn't brought that up, brought put that on. The ice house was at the... Uh, was that on this? Yeah. Right yes. Here. It says, a stunning piece of semi-translucent architecture. Their group claims it celebrates the present of, presence of a human habitat as a beacon of light on the Martian surface, surface by using features that create stunning light refractions. I mean, how crazy is the beautiful is that? And then this one ice house, they said that subsurface ice is abundant on Mars. So subsurface ice means under, under, you know, inside the is, is there's ice is abundant on Mars and this dwelling made from, yeah, that, from a thin vertical ice shell would be capable of protecting the interior habitants from radiation while wow. still celebrating life above. Cause we know the radiation is really bad up there, but isn't that, isn't that beautiful? You, Look at yeah. Them. These are incredible. Which one do you like? I, I feel my, my favorite is, um, let's see here. That. This reminds me of what I talk about my presentations. I mean, is this like, so this is inside a uh, dome? Yes. Right and that's been, you know, these have been, I mean, I was obsessed by Bucky Fuller. I wanted to take Bucky Fuller and put him up on Mars. So mm -hmm. a lot of these are wow. sort of, you know, I've been watching the progressions, but the interior, because of course, obviously they have to not only think about like what we were thinking about a long time ago, physical, air quality, light, gravity the psychological effects of isolation, sleep deprivation, confinement up there, the psychosocial, the crew factors in life, habitability, which is the hygiene, the noise and the privacy. Um, they, you know, they, they can't really get more water up there. And can they have babies mm -hmm. up there? I mean, how does all of that work? How do they take medical supplies up there for 20 years? How do they, you know, they, they can plant a lot of their own food and live on that but they're obviously the the weather the storms the winds are obviously very intense there and some of them are you know little pockets of bubbles in all different kinds of material that satisfy the needs of the harsh weather and they, they've actually found ice on the surface right yes they have so they they could melt that down and have drink the water couldn't they or do you think it would be polluted and toxic. That's what, so much of what the water is the biggest thing other than the air the water and the food of course the contamination but the water for recycling and they'll fig they figured out all these different ways of gray water that they can recycle everything but that's why those interior forests and gardens are so important and they also let real light in real natural light that you can't really do because the winds are so ferocious um yeah. But that's why, though, I thought I thought you might put that. I'm glad you put those up because those are pretty modern, really cool. So, um, yeah, definitely really incredible. And I, I wanted to ask you earlier, actually, when you're talking about Mars, do you feel like have you you've heard the story about how supposedly a lot of people say that there was an ancient civilization on Mars and that like some sort of nuclear war happened there? Or something like that. Do you think it's possible something like that could have happened there? Like, what? yeah, I've you know, talked to probably a hundred people at every conference, and I, I talked to a couple of people yesterday. I say, do you still think Mars? Yes. And look at what they found down there: pyramids, those mm -hmm. face that they've been showing for years, and now that Hubble and all these beautiful telescopes and, and satellites have gotten such remarkable underground. We're going to see a lot more civilizations. I'm sure people are there. I, I mean, I'm not sure people are there, but I've talked to a lot of people who say there are a lot of really people there and on the backside where we can't see them. And also inside, inside all the planets have been underground, either DUMBs, you know, mil down underneath military bases or habitats that go down five or 10 stories or just caves that they're starting to rebuild now. But that's the next West 
California's done, our country <laughs> has been sort of robbed of a lot of its natural resources, oh, yeah, other than, you know, some places in South America and, you know, of course, some of the United States. But the, the, I think that's the, ne the next 20 or 30 years, you're, we're all going to be going. I can't wait to go. I wanted to uh, pull up also, you were just mentioning uh, like hollowing out asteroids or going in or people being inside planets. Um, I wanted to know what you thought of the hollowed out asteroid concept or the bubble world concept. I was showing that here. I think um, there are. I think there are people. There are people living everywhere, beings and humans under the oceans, in volcanoes, up in uh, everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere now. They're just going to keep coming more and more and more. But inside asteroids, inside all the planets, um, I there, there's so many articles online. Just you know, I I've, I've read about this. I have this in my presentation, but there's a lot of articles online even saying that. NASA has talked about actually hollowing out asteroids to be able to drive them around in space, possibly. And I, I didn't know that was something that was actually like talked about in like mainstream articles, but I was just looking today and noticed that. And I thought that was really interesting. Isn't that crazy? Um, well, I don't know if I should even talk about this because I, I can't confirm a lot of things myself, but I've talked to several other people on this man I've been talking to for two and a half years, who is a rocket scientist that I mentioned to you. Um, turned mystic because he was taken off craft and he's been doing this work for about 20 years now, but he also works at Lockheed and other places. But he, um, he's he been reading me um, for about two and a half years. And I've been, and I can, I have a few glimpses of a, a little bit of it because I'm trying, I'm, all I want to do is remember. I'm, I've been doing a lot of work to unblock some of the programs and some of them, um, I'm not fearful at all anymore. And I know, but all those people said at 70, you're going to wake up a lot of, a lot of wake up calls come at certain times. They said they're sort of like on a speed dial and you wake up at certain times. I know this is my time. But um, as, as he's told me, I have um, several hybrid kids that are living inside an asteroid about 60,000 light years away. Mm -hmm. um, and that I have, um, that I've been in many of the inside of planets doing interior work. My father has confirmed that with him and several other people. I won't name, bring up their names, but um, Dave has talked about this to many people. I've sent a lot of people to him because um, he has, a, you know, we all have, everybody has their gifts of what they can do, but I've evidently been going off planet and going in, on inside of planet since I was about 10 years old. And um I had a reading with him yesterday because I knew I I thought I had gone off planet. I sort of felt it um, the night I arrived. I went at that. Remember, I told you I went on the CE five, and I I remembered I was staying at a hotel, uh, July six, July seventh, and he confirmed that. And um, I said I think I went up while, after the CE five in the middle of the night. And he said, yes, you were there. He said, you were there for a while. And I said, what was I doing? Was I doing the same thing, doing working on the interior? And he said, yeah, I saw you with your um, iPad, with the iPad, with your stick. And I don't even use that here on Earth, but <laughs> he always used me with mine. And he said, what do you see? What can we do down here? And I said, it felt like it was about a size of a football field. And he said it was. A lot of these caves are the size of a football field. Actually, Venus, I remember the title of the 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 conference crazy uh, Vesuvians. That was the whole point. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mentioned to maybe you or a couple of people that I said, Oh, I haven't been to Venus yet. Well, I went that night and evidently wow. there were only seven of us there, several Palladians, several Arcturians. And they said, what would you do with this? Cause they, and it was, it's all, I said, again, it, it look, I remember it was all rock floor, rock walls. And then they want me to help create the interior for them to hang out in, to live in. And th this is the last inside of a um, subsurface habitat that um, of all the solar system, because I've been to all the other planets for since, you know, 1961. Um, um, the Pleiadians or the Arcturians invite me, they take me there. I go and I help them create, I blend my art and aesthetics and architecture and do landscapes and make them. 
And they like, and I evidently, what Dave tells me and several other people have said that they like it because I'm not judgmental of the different species. They're humans, they're with us, they're ETs with their, us there. And I go, well, how can I, I don't do telepathy now yet. I've been wanting to, I'm working on it. And they said, well, about six years ago, one person told me this, oh, uh, about six months ago, they said they had invented a, uh, uh, a machine that can help people off plan like me or you, unless you do telepathy, um, to do it when we're working off planet. So I can speak to the America, the humans, whoever they are, because they're always humans in most of these places. So anyway, evidently, I think there's going to be, there are people everywhere and beings everywhere working together. A lot of the people I've talked to off planet over the last few years, a friend of mine who was a big deal, Hollywood, um, special effects guy for Avatar and about for 14 years past, about three years ago. And I talked to him regularly with his mom, who's one of my best friends. And he says, Mary, the planets, they are expanding all over. He said, it's in groupings. He said, a lot of the communities that he said, he goes way out, way out into the multiverse. And he said, it's, you know, it's there, there are people everywhere. There are huge studios of people working on all these incredible habitats. And I said, just now, if, you know, if I, we go through a, a, a wormhole or a portal, do the Palladians have their own colors? Or the, and he said, yeah, I design them for people too. He said, you can't even believe what we're doing up there. And so I've been able to talk to him with this Dave the Mystic to help his mom get through her son's death three years ago. She was really obviously very close with him and I was close with him. So I figured out a way to just talk to him once a week for the last couple of years to help her get through it. Now we just talk all the time. <laughs> so he um, he says, people are, we're going to make it through this. We're not going to collapse. There's not going to be Armageddon. We're going to make it through done for the last drop of yes, being dumbbells down here in 3d. But um, mm -hmm. he's the expansiveness, the creativity, the love they're up there helping us as, as he knows. And we know, I know that too. They're so supportive. They want us. They're not going to do it for us, but they're really working hard to in, in get us to change our frequency, change our, you know, get up, up level our frequency so we can all become one more unified consciousness to really help elevate everybody to get That's through. really incredible. What do you mean by unified consciousness? Like kind of more like a hive mind consciousness or? Hive mind, well, um, we've been so dumbed down by government mostly and some of the secret space programs over the last 70 years, really like my whole life. And that's why I'm so angry with that they kept all this information from us for so long. And that's why we are going to be the disclosure. You are the young yeah. people are like, but um, so yeah, we, the, the fear, we live in one of two areas, fear or love. And because of the drugs, the overuse of drugs the last 70 years, the opiate deaths that we're seeing now, and a lot of people believe that COVID was created. I mean, you know, who knows? I don't do a lot. I just don't go there. But um, it's we've been really dumbed down for a long time. So all of us together, you, me, everybody on the show, everybody, we have to really work hard to elevate our consciousness to bring the people who are really struggling all those corners of the United States that, you know, one out of three people that don't get food. I mean, we have to raise the consciousness or we will not make it through this big test right now. This is the biggest test of our lives right now. The um, fracking, the waters are polluted. We've destroyed our waters, our seas, our fish, our trees, our, you know, I've been to Peru now five or six times working with people on environmental films. We, you know, you know that we're all, we have to help other people to raise the vibration to get us to at least four or five dimensions. People keep saying, oh, we're at fourth dimension, fifth dimension. People tell me I can go up to 20. I guess people can go up to whatever you can go to. I don't know. I don't, I don't really think about it that way. But we, we need consciousness is everybody. It, we are a hive consciousness. We are all one, every tree, every rock, every building, you, me, everybody, everything is part of the same vibration. 
And I've known that since somehow since the day I was born, I knew that I thought water was God and source. I always, and I, the trees have always spoken to me and I've always spoken to them. I feel so alive every day when I jump out of bed, I'm so grateful to be here. And that's why I've done in my little way with all my learning issues and weirdness, couldn't do it. I really didn't do engineering because I knew I could, wouldn't get through it. I didn't want to anyway. I wanted to do it my way with what I felt comfortable with. And that's what, why I love space and spaces because we can, you know, we can shift people's energy. We can change communities. We can change an individual. We can change everybody if we put our minds to it. And we, we need to do like group meditations. We need to do everything we can to get us from ruining any more of our land and letting, getting go of that greed and power that I grew up with at those cocktail parties and dinners. And I saw a lot of it, like I talked to Laura Eisenhower and a bunch of people. I'm nowhere like what she is but in stretcher, but I grew up with a lot of those guys. And it's just shocking that a lot of really smart people are, are all about money and greed and power and not letting, not really seeing the pure, how fragile our planet is, how fragile our beautiful air is and how the waters are just getting destroyed and the big government and big companies. Um, hopefully we'll start waking up more. You know, I hope, hopefully they will take some responsibility for it. So we, you know, it's, we already dumped it on you and, you know, our, my hyper kids and all the younger generation to fix it. But it's, it's, we're at the, it's the countdown now and it, we're going to get through it, but we just have to be really positive and lift people up as much as we can, like all the incredible things you do and that everybody that's watching this, all of us that are here are here in our own, we play our part, whatever it is, like my son who is just here, he works at the Presidio Trust every day planting the seed of the Presidio Trust on 450 acres for the future. So Amazing. all, you know, whatever we do that's positive, we, we benevolent ones um, are here to help in every little ripple. It all makes a difference. So. Yeah. You know, that. thank you so much, Mary. This has been a really incredible interview and yeah, you know, that the work I've been doing with my solutions for humanity presentation is, you know, that's why I, I feel called to do that because I feel that, like you were saying, we're definitely at like a crossroads or a turning point and we really need to step things up and just, you know, I, I feel like with my presentation, like putting the thoughts out there, these different concepts and people seeing it, like it's just like planting seeds and at least like, you know, we can do that to get things started. And, you know, I love that you're working with self-sustaining homes and, you know, uh, space habitats and everything. So I uh, really love all the work you've done. It's really incredible. Um, well, let's do some together. Let's build another little coalition. And I was so, I, I'm, I'm just going to say, I told you how blown away I was by your talk. You inspired me so much. You are such a big, bright light. I loved you standing up there. I loved your presentation. I love your ones, your power, your smarts, your kindness. You have such a big heart and you, the ripple effect right now is going everywhere. So I thank you and I appreciate you. I'm so glad we met. I'd love to help you in any way I can and let's help each other. I'm, I'm so glad to. Yeah, definitely. Let's do some work together. I'm excited. Hey, maybe we're already doing some work up there, you know, <laughs> sure. makes sense to me. Um, so I, we have a few minutes left of the show. Is there any way you would like anything you'd like to say in closing, um, where people can find you? I know I can actually pull up your site right here. Um, your site is maryedwardsdesign.com. Yes. I'm maryedwardsdesign.com. And my email, if you'd like it is M. There are a lot of Mary Edwards is M E E. D W A R D S 11 at gmail.com. M E Edwards 11 at gmail.com. I think it's in the last one. I don't know where it is. I haven't looked at that for a while. <laughs> um, M E Edwards 11. I'm an 11, 11 girl at gmail.com. And I'm in San Francisco and let's see, is it there? Oh, I don't know where I am. Thank you for, showing me what I need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to find no, you. No, thank you. Okay. I don't know. It shouldn't be that hard. 
Okay. It's on the bottom somewhere, but Mary Edwards design.com, but I am M E Edwards 11 at gmail.com to ease. But anyway, what a treat this has been. Thank you so much for having me on. And I've loved sharing with you the habitats of the future and ideas here. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, Oh, maybe we could do a part two sometime and really get into more of the designs. I feel that, you know, we were talking about, you know, your, your story most of the time, but we got into some of the different designs and ideas, but, you know, I, I really feel that moving on and becoming a spacefaring civilization and building out these habitats is going to be a really amazing solution for humanity. Um, you know, especially being above earth away from the cataclysms. I mean, there's so many amazing, um, aspects to it. So I'm really excited to see where humanity goes with that. I would love to do that. And I apologize. I didn't, I really did talk the whole time. So let's do part oh, two. No, it's great. In the you, next weeks, the next month I'm around, I would love to do that. And awesome. um, yeah, love that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mary. Thanks for coming on and thanks everyone for joining tonight. I know this was a really amazing conversation and i'm definitely excited to have you back mary so that'd be really great so all right everyone until next time on apollo's odyssey over and out